Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. This issue presents an interpretation of the memoir, Speak Memory, by Vladimir Nobokov, one of the most important literary masters of the 20th century and a Russian-American writer. If you have systematically read Nabokov's works, you will be amazed at the richness and unity of his literary achievements. His contributions to novels, poetry, prose, criticism, and translation mutually complement each other reflecting a highly consistent aesthetic pursuit. Therefore, when you put these achievements together, you will see a complete, elegant, and self-contained structure. However, Nabokov's works are known for their high level of difficulty, often causing readers to hesitate. Speak Memory was originally published in 1951 and later expanded and reissued in 1966, serving as a suitable entry point to understand Nabokov. It is considered appropriate for several reasons. First, it is one of Nabokov's rare works where he reflects on his own history and explores his inner self, providing crucial material to understand how Nobokov became Nobokov. Secondly, as an outstanding stylist, Nobokov concentrates in this book to showcase his magical command of language, making it a work comparable to his most important novel, Lolita. Therefore, the book immediately sparked enthusiastic reactions in the literary world after its publication. In 2011, Time magazine selected it as one of the top 100 classic nonfiction works of all time, with the comment, through brilliant, rich, and perfect prose, it deepens the perception of resurrected memories in an impressionistic manner. To understand the meaning of this statement, we can gradually comprehend it through the following interpretation. In the preface, Nobukov clearly states that the work is a collection of systematic and related personal memoirs, geographically spanning from St. Petersburg to St. Senery in France, with a time span of 37 years from August 1903 to May 1940. In other words, it is not a memoir planned from the beginning but a series of autobiographical essays assembled in chronological order. The first piece published in the magazine, Mademoiselle O later became the fifth chapter of the book. However, once they are reorganized, they seamlessly fit together in terms of style, rhythm, and the recurring presence of important events and images. This is the charm of Nabokov's works, his precise grasp of the internal structure of the text, always handled with naturalness and relevance, seemingly not relying on following specific rules but purely on intuition. When reading this book, one may encounter obstacles if only staying on the surface of the text. Although Nobokov defines the geographical and time frame at the beginning, he does not provide a constant timeline and background information as typical memoirs do. He does not want to disrupt the flow of consciousness and the transitions between scenes with such content. In some paragraphs, to authentically recreate memories, Nobokov employs fictional techniques and even includes surreal details giving the entire text a constantly fluctuating between reality and fantasy. Therefore, in the following interpretation, to facilitate understanding, we will interweave the text with background information, creating a contrast between the bulk of perspective and an external perspective. The first sentence of the main text states, The cradle rocks above an abyss, and common sense tells us that our existence is but a brief crack of light between two eternities of darkness. According to research, this sentence is likely a paraphrase of the famous line by British historian Thomas Carlyle, Life is but a fleeting glimpse between two eternities. However, immediately following, Nobokov extends the idea with several philosophical paragraphs, starting from the boundlessness of time, leading to his insights into how people perceive memory. In Nabokov's view, the awakening of consciousness is a series of spaced-out flashes. Only when one establishes a clear self-awareness and realizes the specific relationship between one's age and the age of parents does a person become aware of sharing elements of time with oneself and things beyond oneself, which is entirely different from the spatial world. Thus, Nobokov finds the starting point in his memories not in his birth on April 22, 1899, but in that August day in 1903. He freezes the first frame in his hometown of St. Petersburg, in a country villa named Vira, where his mother holds the left hand of the four-year-old young Nobokov, and his father holds his right hand. When reading this book, we must get used to Nabokov's impressionistic expression, understanding that he, like Proust, 
recalls while simultaneously presenting the process of how he enters into these recollections. We follow frame after frame of images, revealing countless dense details. As details accumulate, the precision of the scenes increases, presenting before us a tranquil and affluent estate with fifty fixed servants, a westernized, cultured large family, and an underlying sense of unease. Let me briefly explain Nabokov's family background and the era his family faced during Nabokov's childhood. From the mid-18th century to the 19th century, the Nabokov family produced several politicians and military figures, maintaining close ties with the court, while adhering to a tradition that Nabokov himself was proud of. Throughout Russia's various efforts toward westernization, his ancestors consistently held a relatively enlightened and positive attitude. However, the tumultuous changes in the external world did not allow this family to develop along a path of health and happiness. Nobukov mentions the disastrous Russo-Japanese War, which occurred from 1904 to 1905. The war ended with Russia's defeat, directly leading to the First Russian Revolution in 1905. The book does not systematically and clearly explain why, after 1905, Nabokov's family frequently went abroad for temporary residence. In reality, it was because his father, old Nobokov, had become a liberal oppositionist. Not only did he fully support the revolution, but he even turned their home in St. Petersburg into a meeting room for revolutionary activities. This more radical stance caused dissatisfaction within the entire family. Consequently, old Nobokov led the whole family abroad for longer periods, traveling through Italy, Austria, France, and Germany. Regarding this, Nobokov subtly points out in the book, long before the revolution wiped away the landscapes of my youth, I had already experienced the various sorrows and joys of homesickness. Afterward, the fate of the family and the entire country was in constant flux. In 1916, Nabokov's uncle passed away, leaving him an inheritance equivalent to several million dollars and a 2,000-acre estate. However, just a year later, the tide of the October Revolution swept across Russia. Old Nobokov, who had held important positions in the provisional government, couldn't keep up with the new revolutionary situation and gradually distanced himself from the victorious faction, ultimately being viewed as an enemy. After the October Revolution, the Nobokov family began their true life of exile in 1919, and Nobokov lost the estate he had just inherited. Regarding this, he casually wrote in the third chapter of the book, I derived no special joy from my inheritance, nor did I feel any anger when it was abolished overnight by the Bolshevik Revolution. What he cared more about, or what lingered in his mind, were those precious scenes and sounds. He remembered his uncle often sitting in front of the white piano in the country villa, singing with a loud tenor voice, and the melancholic sounds reaching the cool, trembling path. In the second chapter of the book, there is a somewhat fantastical narrative. Nobokov had extraordinary mathematical intuition as a child, but he claims that this talent mysteriously disappeared in his youth. However, before its disappearance, mathematical ability tormented him during his childhood illnesses. When suffering from recurrent tonsillitis and scarlet fever, he felt huge spheres and enormous numbers mercilessly swelling in his throbbing brain, to the point that he would often speak incoherently to his mother. One day, lying in his sickbed, Nobokov suddenly found himself immersed in a peculiar sense of relaxation and tranquil pleasure. He knew his mother had gone out to buy him a gift, and he seemed to have gained some kind of extraordinary vision vividly envisioning his mother riding a sled to the street. This vision, both real and illusory, or particularly vivid and precise imagination, would later become one of the most distinctive features of his novels. In Nabokov's memory, the childhood illnesses time and again were the process of his mathematical talent being forced to disappear in unbearable pain. However, at the same time, his perception of literature was opened up, and the nature and boundaries of consciousness were greatly expanded. The mathematical prodigy finally transformed into a literary genius. In addition, another significant factor that had a profound impact on his literary career was his unique linguistic background. Initially, like many children from Russian aristocratic families with pro-English sentiments, 
Nobukov underwent a rich but somewhat chaotic language education through the influence of private tutors and frequent travels abroad with his family. In this book, Nobukov repeatedly mentions his family's preference for the comfortable traditions of Anglo-Saxon civilization, recalling the dazzling array of British nannies and governesses he encountered during his childhood, some of whom greeted him with twisting hands in distress, while others greeted him with elusive smiles. His father accidentally discovered that his seven-year-old eldest son's English reading ability far surpassed his Russian before French, and his father was astonished. He promptly arranged for the headmaster to give him Russian lessons. When recalling this memory, Nabokov's portrayal of the headmaster's image clearly carries a lyrical tone, even the corn on his light blue eyes is fascinating. The headmaster brought a set of Russian alphabet building blocks, treating them as if they were invaluable when he used them. It is important to note that the emotion hinted at here is just the beginning. Throughout Nabokov's literary career, especially in the latter part of his life spent in exile, his expressions of nostalgia for the mother tongue, not sparing in words and repeatedly emphasizing, became a significant theme in his writings. For example, when Nobukov later talked about his life in Berlin after moving there in the early 20th century, he said, I was panicking afraid that learning fluent German would damage my precious Russian. Fortunately, the task of linguistic closure was relatively easier because I lived in a closed circle of exiles, dealing with Russian friends all day, reading only Russian newspapers, magazines, and books. My involvement in the local language was limited to greetings with successive landlords and necessary shopping activities. After moving to the United States, he complained, Moving from my magnificent Russian palace to the cramped English abode is like moving from one dark room to another on a starless night during a strike by candle makers and torch bearers. He even used more intense language, saying, My personal tragedy, a tragedy that others cannot and will not care about, is that I have to give up my mother tongue, the unrestricted, rich, and easily handled Russian, in exchange for second-rate English. It should be pointed out that in the history of world literature, there are many novelists who, for various reasons, have written in both their mother tongue and a non-native language. Nobukov can be considered an outstanding representative among them. Compared to Milan Kundera, novels written by Nobukov in English were much more successful than those written by Kundera in French, as most of Kundera's successful works were written in Czech. However, in various instances, Nobukov fervently expressed his longing for the mother tongue, more passionately than Kundera. Analyzing the intrinsic reasons, there might be two. Firstly, as an individual with a strong personality, Nabokov's sense of belonging in political culture was not as strong as Kandaris. Secondly, mother tongue for Nobokov was specific to every syllable, every punctuation mark, while also being a highly abstract concept. Nabokov's refinement of textual precision reached an extremely demanding level, and he was enamored with irrational perspectives and sudden zoom ins. For example, he liked to suddenly change perspectives within a sentence, a word, or even an unfinished syllable. He unconsciously attempted to transcend the boundaries of any language and constantly grappled with the pain of not being able to reach the other side. Rather than saying he lost perfect Russian, it is more accurate to say that he wanted to break free from the constraints of any language currently in use. Interestingly, Maintaining this anxious state was crucial for forging the bulk of intricate and elaborate, seemingly unbroken sentences and text structures. Only by harboring a perpetual longing for the imagined perfection could he use the English, which he deemed a second-rate language, as light and magical as possible. Butterflies also held a special place in the bulk of life. In addition to his outstanding literary achievements, Nobukov had another important identity as an entomologist. While in the United States, he served as the head of the Lepidoptera Department at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University. He captured and prepared thousands of butterfly specimens, and several species were named after him. He wrote extensive academic papers on the subject. In January 2011, the Royal Society of London announced, after a 10-year genetic study, that Nabokov's research had sufficient scientific basis acknowledging his significant contribution to improving the classification system of butterflies. About how he developed this lifelong hobby, there is a detailed account in this book. At the age of eight, 
In the storage room of the country villa, Nobukov discovered several illustrated scientific works on butterflies, sparking his lifelong passion. A single sentence in the book succinctly outlines self-portraits of Nobukov at different times, capturing butterflies in various climate zones and various outfits. A handsome little boy in knickerbockers wearing a sailor hat, a globally wandering, slim emigrant wearing quarter pants and a beret, a chubby old man in shorts without a hat, like characters growing up in the overlapping shots of a film. More miraculously, Nobukov writes about capturing and then losing a butterfly in the villa's estate during his childhood. It rises and dodges, flying high towards the east. He writes about the butterfly crossing mountains and islands, heading south along the Rocky Mountains, after a 40-year-long race, finally caught in Colorado. This long sentence, composed in one breath, has over 20 clauses, spanning Europe and America in space and crossing 40 years in time. Is it possible for a butterfly to live for 40 years, or to cross vast oceans? In the literary context, under Nabokov's masterful technical control, it not only establishes itself but effortlessly breaks the boundaries between fiction and reality, vividly expressing how a hobby can lurk in the code of destiny, and how the past and the future can exchange signals. If this book is likened to a pastoral symphony, then the recurring theme, akin to a rondo, is undoubtedly related to young Nabokov's father, old Nobokov. As mentioned earlier, Old Nabokov's image in young Nabokov's eyes is upright and majestic, summarized in his own words as a great, classless Russian intellectual. Even during the period of exile abroad, old Nabokov did not give up his political ideals. He edited the newspaper for liberal exiles and organized gatherings. In 1922, during one such gathering, two right-wing assassins suddenly burst in, and old Nabokov shielded his main political opponent within the party only to be shot and killed in the chaos. If someone else were writing, the heroic death of the father might have become the most vivid stroke in the book, but Nobukov simply mentioned it briefly. In 1922, he was assassinated by a cunning thug, who was later appointed as the administrative officer for Russian immigrant affairs during the Second World War. This account is not even precise enough, as there were actually two thugs present. However, Many corners of this book subtly allude to this event. Nabokov's most important biographer even believes that the main structural feature of this book is a comprehensive and repetitive foreshadowing of the fatal shooting, creating a fateful sense of mystery, with the most famous passage appearing in the fifth section of the first chapter. Nabokov begins by describing a typical scene from his childhood at the villa, a family having lunch in the bright, many-windowed, walnut-paneled dining room downstairs. During the meal, a bent-over, sorrowful-looking butler, Alexei, would quietly inform the father that some villagers wished to meet the master outside. Nabokov's father usually immediately agreed to their requests, such as special subsidies or allowing them to harvest crops from a certain piece of land. In gratitude, his father would accept torment with ethnic characteristics, being tossed and shaken by more than twenty people and then safely caught. The camera then returns to the dining room from outside. From where Nobukov sat, looking through a west-facing window, one could see the spectacular sight of his father being tossed and soaring into the air. The following passage is often used by literary critics for textual analysis. Nobukov writes there, For a little while, the figure of my father in a white summer suit billowed by the wind would appear, spectacularly stretching his body in the air, limbs assuming strange and casual postures, with a calm and handsome face turned towards the sky. The second time would be higher than the first, and during the final, highest flight, he would seem to perpetually recline, against the cobalt blue sky of midsummer, like those characters flying freely on the domes of churches, with so many folds in their clothes, and below them, the candles held by mortals would be lit one by one, tiny flames densely converging in the smoky air, the priest chanting the eternal rest lilies for funerals swaying in the flickering candlelight, obscuring the face of whoever lay in the open coffin. Nobukov then abruptly shifts in the second half of the sentence, the camera swiftly moving from outside the dining room to over a decade later, where young Nobukov, during his father's burial, bends down to gaze at his father lying in the coffin, imagining his father's soul ascending into the sky, before returning to the real world. 
The transition in focus is so sudden yet so graceful, without any obvious, traceable markers. Reading the book Speak Memory, the most crucial aspect is grasping Nabokov's narrative technique, which is the essence of his work and a microcosm of the pinnacle of 20th century narrative art. In essence, this book delves into a question Nabokov contemplated throughout his life, how to resist the passage of time, how to break through the limits of consciousness, and why sometimes using fictional means can bring us closest to reality. As a scientist, Nabokov knew that these problems, unsolvable by science, could perhaps be entrusted to literature and art. Understanding this, reading speak memory can become a cyclical process. At any time, from any section, it may bring new insights. All right, we've interpreted the content for you in this issue. Let's review the key points. 1. Nabokov's literary achievements are rich and cohesive, with notable contributions in novels, poetry, essays, criticism, and translations. Together, they form a complete, aesthetically unified structure. 2. Speak Memory is a collection of systematically related personal memoirs, spanning geographically from St. Petersburg to St. Senery in France, covering a time span of 37 years from August 1903 to May 1940. It is not a planned memoir from the beginning but a series of memoir essays compiled chronologically. 3. The significance of Speak Memory lies in being one of Nabokov's rare works where he retrospects on his history and explores his inner self serving as essential material for understanding why Nobokov became Nobokov. As an outstanding stylist, Nobokov concentrates his magical control of language and speak memory, making it comparable to his most important novels. 4. Reading speak memory may encounter obstacles if one only stays on the surface of the text. Although Nobokov defines the geographical and time scope, unlike typical memoirs providing a timeline and background details, he refrains from using such information to disrupt the flow of consciousness and the transition of scenes. In certain paragraphs, to vividly recreate memories, Nobokov employs fictional techniques, even introducing surreal details, creating an atmosphere of both reality and illusion throughout the text. 5. Nabokov's refinement of language precision reaches an extreme level. He is enamored with non-rational perspectives and sudden zooms, enjoying sudden shifts in perspective within a sentence, a word, or even an unfinished syllable. Unconsciously, he attempts to transcend the boundaries of any language, always grappling with the pain of not being able to reach the other side. Rather than losing perfect Russian, it's more accurate to say he wants to break free from the constraints of any language in current use. Interestingly, maintaining this anxious state is indispensable for forging the book of Syntricate, and elaborate long sentences and text structures. 6. When reading speak memory, the most important aspect is understanding Nabokov's narrative technique, which represents the essence of his work and serves as a microcosm of the peak development of narrative art in the 20th century. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.